The 1966 Beatles song, Rain, is a tragically overlooked but extremely pivotal moment in both their recording career and the history of pop music. In this episode, I'm going to point out the elements that make this song revolutionary. And as a fair warning, once I point them out, you can't unhear this. Early 1966 was a period of explosive creativity for the Beatles, as they evolved from the youthful ambassadors of Beatlemania into a cultural force that embraced new musical influences, new freedoms of studio production time and resources, and new mind-altering drugs. The song Rain was born in the midst of this transition, conceived by John Lennon and composed with input from Paul. On April 14, 1966, following the recording session at EMI Studios that produced Paperback Writer, the band turned to this new song, Rain. They went through five takes of the rhythm track with their usual lineup, John on guitar, George also on guitar, Paul on bass, and Ringo, of course, on drums. Although all of their performances are fantastic here, the highlight of the session was undoubtedly Ringo's contribution, which he has claimed to be his most inspired performance on any Beatles record. And that's saying quite a lot. After the band was satisfied with the basic rhythm track, John recorded his lead vocal. If the rain comes, they run and hide their heads. And then called it a night. The song was far from finished, however. The band returned to the studio two days later on the 16th of April, where they spent 11 hours transforming the song into what we hear today. During this marathon session, numerous bits were added, such as those transcendent harmonies. Rain. and Ringo adding a tambourine part. Here's where things get interesting. Paul wanted to add a new bass track to replace his initial attempt from the 14th. Both Paul and John had complained to the EMI engineers that the bass sound on Beatles records paled in comparison to the punchy bass that they had heard on R&B and soul records coming from American labels like Stax and Motown. By this point in their career, when the Beatles asked for something at EMI, they got it. And so their young and spirited engineer, Jeff Emmerich, devised a makeshift solution by rewiring a loudspeaker to act as a microphone. The idea being that the wider diaphragm of a loudspeaker would capture the bass frequencies more prominently. The technique had been tested earlier during the paperback writer sessions, and Paul asked to use it again for rain. The next radical innovation is so subtle that you probably wouldn't notice it unless it were pointed out. And following rain, it would become a staple in their bag of studio tricks. A week earlier, the band began work on their most experimental track to date, Tomorrow Never Knows, then called Mark One, an avant-garde psychedelic piece filled with tape loops, weird vocal effects, and tons of other unconventional elements. But that's for another episode. During those sessions, the band had stumbled upon a studio technique that was fairly uncommon outside of novelty records, changing the speed of the tape to affect the key and tone of their sound. It had been used briefly the year earlier on Rubber Soul, when their producer George Martin recorded a keyboard solo at half speed, making it sound almost like a harpsichord when it was played back at full speed. But on Rain, they took this trick to a whole other level. Here's how the rhythm track likely sounded when it was performed live. And compare it to the final version. That drop in pitch and speed is the result of the tape being slowed down lending a heavier and almost surreal quality that wouldn't have been the same if the band simply played it slower. And that was exciting all on its own, but being the Beatles, they weren't satisfied with just one speed adjustment, of course. John's lead vocal was also manipulated, but in the opposite direction. John sang his part while the tape deck was slowed down slightly, so that when it was played back at normal speed, his voice would sound a bit faster and higher in pitch. 
Based on the studio notes, John's original vocal would have sounded something like this. If the rain comes, they run and hide their heads. And the final version. The rain comes, they run and hide their heads. It's hard to describe why this effect sounds so cool, but it suits the song perfectly. This technique used on Rain would alter the course of the Beatles' career, and they would incorporate Verispeed, as it's called, extensively throughout the Revolver, Sgt. Pepper, and Magical Mystery Tour sessions, most notably on Strawberry Fields Forever. Let me take you down, cause I'm going to Strawberry Fields. The next radical step forward introduced on Rain is, ironically, backward. There's a bit of a dispute in Beatles lore over who actually came up with the idea, but as is the case with many Beatles innovations, it was likely the result of a happy little accident. John claimed he had stumbled upon the idea at his home the night before the rain session, after randomly playing a tape backward and realizing that the effect could be used intentionally. In another account, the legendary Beatles producer George Martin claimed to have pieced it together on his own after the session, and then presented his work to John, who was summarily impressed. The truth, as is often the case, is probably somewhere in the middle. More importantly, though, let's examine how they did it. Here's the isolated backward vocals as we hear them in the outro of the song. And here's how that part sounds when reversed. If the rain comes, they run and hide their heads. Suddenly it sounds familiar, right? John's snippet from the main vocal track was simply overdubbed on top of the outro, but in reverse. A simple trick, but it lends a special, otherworldly quality to the song. <laughs> On a funny side note, when Rain was released in Japan, the album included a lyric sheet in Japanese and English. And someone attempted to guess what John was saying in this part, seemingly oblivious to the reverse effect. There's also some evidence that the band had experimented with reversed guitar parts as well on this day, but they didn't make it into the final mix of Rain for some reason. That technique would show up later on songs from Revolver, such as I'm Only Sleeping, and Tomorrow Never Knows. I can't understate how wild this innovation is. Rain, along with Tomorrow Never Knows and I'm Only Sleeping, were the first pop records ever to use backward sounds in this way. It would soon become a staple of psychedelic rock, employed in some capacity by everyone from Jimi Hendrix <laughs> to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Backward lyrics would also become a perennial target for conspiracy theorists, alleging everything from embedded satanic messages to hints of the premature demise of Paul McCartney. And we have Rain to thank for making all of that possible. Despite not being among their greatest hits, Rain holds a very special place, not only in my personal favorites, but also in the Beatles canon overall. As we've discovered, the song is a showcase of their studio ingenuity during the analog era. And all of this was achieved using rudimentary four-track recorders, decades before digital technology would make these effects so effortless that we now take them for granted. Like a Skunk Works team, the engineers at EMI were constantly inventing creative solutions with limited resources. 
and many of the creative achievements pioneered that week in April at EMI would be used extensively throughout the latter part of their career and leave a lasting imprint on pop music. As a song, Rain is thrillingly unconventional for its time, a reflection of the band's flourishing interest in styles outside of their comfort zone, such as classical Indian music and the avant-garde. Thematically, it's one of their first songs to move beyond love and relationships and instead focus on the treasure of the mundane, a theme that would emerge in full bloom on the Revolver album with songs about taxes, sleep, lonely people, and yellow submarines. I wasn't around in June 1966, but Rain must have sounded pretty wild at the time, especially from the band who up until that point had been singing simple two minute, 20 second pop hits about love. It was also a preview of what was to come, both on the Revolver album in August of that year, and then Sgt. Pepper in June 1967, which would solidify the Beatles as ambassadors of pop innovation. Even beyond the song itself, Rain was special for being one of the earliest attempts at a creative promotional music video for a single, paving the way for an approach that would become commonplace on MTV 15 years later. But sadly, Rain never really got the attention it deserved, likely because the song was relegated to the B-side of the 1966 paperback writer single. It wasn't released on any album until four years later, when it was included on the 1970 singles compilation album Hey Jude. In a way, Rain has shared the fate of other overlooked transcendent gems from this era, such as Hey Bulldog and It's All Too Much. Thankfully, those songs too have been re-released in a handful of other places over the years and have earned some belated recognition. Some fans would say, and I would tend to agree, that Rain may be the ultimate Beatles song. In three perfect minutes, recorded at nearly the exact midpoint of their eight-year recording career, it captures nearly every element of what made the Beatles special in composition, style, and execution. If I were transported to a distant time or place and could only bring one song to describe the Beatles, I think Rain might be it. So what do you think about Rain? Let me know in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this episode and please remember to subscribe and share. Thanks for watching.